Within a couple months, I had a video go viral. And in less than a year, I had a million followers. I see a lot of DJs try to copy what I do. But when I watch, I go, oh, there's a disconnect there. Like they're not being themselves. And I can sense that. If you're like a financial advisor out there trying to start to grow an audience online, yeah. what are some of those strategies along the way that you think would cross over to finance? Welcome back to another episode of Do Business, Do Life. We have Eric Rhodes, a.k.a. DJ Eric Rhodes, on the show here with us today. Welcome to the show, Eric. Hey, thanks you, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. I've, you know, they actually call me a DJ in my family, but that's not a professional one. But I do love to uh, create you know, a playlist and, and keep the vibe going and it family get together. So it's really fun for me. I told my wife, I'm like, if I ever get my way, I'm going to learn how to actually officially DJ. So maybe down the road, we'll, we'll make that happen. But when we connected, we were actually looking at how do we, how do we take the next triad experience? So you're going to be joining us at the founders retreat out in Amelia Island here in a, a month or two, as we record this in May. And it literally, you just popped up on my IG feed. <laughs> And you were doing mashups, you were doing like country hip hop mashups, you had Nelly woven in there, it was a lot of like my 90s, late 90s, early 2000s hip hop with some good country. And I was just like, man, this guy is, he's, he's putting some good stuff together. And I, we were just talking even before we hit record here and on IG, I think your, your followers have almost doubled this year, if not more than doubled, uh, you're just under a million followers on IG now. So Bottom line, I wanted to get you on here because I think there's so much that financial advisors can learn as they're transitioning from more of a traditional media, radio, TV, and everything's going digital, online, social with YouTube, IG, podcasting. And so I, want, I wanted to get you on here, man, and hear your story. So, so how did this come to be? What's the backstory of DJ Eric Rhodes? Sure. Um... Kind of in a, you know, the, the short version is I started DJing in 2000 in college, uh, did it as a hobby, played at lounges and clubs in Boise, Idaho, and got into TV news about 2007 as a, a videographer and a producer. Didn't really like my career, was DJing on the side. My family and I were about to have a baby. And 2011, I decided, you know what, I want to start, I just want to DJ for a living. I love it. I'm, that's when I'm happy is when I'm performing on the weekends and not, you know, miserable on during the week. So mm. I left my career, uh, waited tables on the side for a few years, started my DJ business and just went all in. And it was local. I was doing private events, weddings, corporate, those kinds of things. And, but I was always really interested in marketing. Mm. So, um, over the years, I just was, you know, as Instagram kind of became a thing and Facebook, all of those, I, I just started to figure out ways to promote my business that way. And I had a lot of fun doing it. And right before COVID, I had a team of DJs and this was really key for me. So I had this team of people that I was managing and trying to, I was trying to run my business. And I, I found that I wasn't really happy doing that. And I, I again, had that like epiphany back at, like I did in 2011. I was like, okay, I'm kind of unhappy doing all of this. What do I love to do? I love to DJ and I love to be, I love to market. And, mm -hmm. and that. so I got rid of the team and went I, all in on those two things. And when I did, I started to have time to be creative. And in 2021, I started putting out mixes on TikTok of me just, you know, just transitioning going, Hey, check out this mix that I do at a wedding, this track to this track. And immediately my video started to take off. And within a couple months I had a video go viral and in less than a year I had, um, about a year, I had a million followers on TikTok just by wow. doing these transitions and engaging in my crowd and doing these little mashups. So ever since, that's become a lot of what I love to do, which is, you know, be on Instagram and TikTok and then also DJ private events. But yeah, it was just uh, something I love to do in, in a way that I knew I, I had to do it to promote my business and my brand. I knew that's that was the key. Okay, so... Before we get into all the social stuff, because I think we can spend so much time there, let, yeah. let's go back because that, so I, I heard a couple themes there already. Okay. I, I wasn't super happy in my, my corporate job or my real, you know, weekday job, and I, but I really loved the weekends and DJing, uh, but it probably wasn't paying the bills in the early days, but it sounds like you weren't, weren't afraid to kind of follow your heart, get uncomfortable, kind of venture into the unknown. And then it sounds like you did that again right as COVID hit and you said, Hey, like 
running this team doesn't sound like a lot of fun and COVID couldn't have been a lot of fun for a DJ. I would, I would think gigs dried up a little bit. So how did you get through the scary parts of that to, to get to today? Uh, belief. Like I just had to believe that I could get through that. And, um, you know, practically it was in the beginning I had to wait tables. So I knew, okay, I had to literally just look at the numbers and go, okay, I can't, I, I don't have enough business yet as a wedding corporate DJ. So I'm, what am I going to do to supplement my income? So I, I figured that out. And then I knew once I build my business, which I had to work late nights and, you know, the library was my office because we'd lived in a smaller home, had a baby. It's like, so I did what I could to, in my spare time to grow the DJ business. Um, and then I knew once I hit a certain income level, I had to cut the, the waiting tables, which let, m- made me have another pay cut, but it was enough to yeah. survive. And then I built from there. And at that point I had momentum. So the same yeah. kind of thing happened. You know, I had enough momentum. I feel like when I let my team go and I knew I was like, if I have more time, if I can double my time that I get to spend DJing marketing, I will grow my business. I just, I just knew it. I just had faith. And I knew that if I worked doing the right things every day, day in and day out, that good things would come from it. And, um, so far it's worked out. <laughs> I, I think it's going okay for you. Um, <laughs> So as, so it sounds, if I'm getting the dates right, about 2021 was where you started really putting stuff out on TikTok. And then it sounded like that then started to spill over into IG and some of the other platforms you've built. Um, yeah. Was that, was that like, Hey, here's my marketing strategy for 2021. I'm going to start putting this out. Was it a little bit like, Hey, I'm going to throw this out there and see what happens. And then it took off. So then you doubled down. How, how did you think through that process? It actually came out of frustration. So one of my marketing strategies was to put out DJ mixes. There's an app called Mixcloud that is, uh, allows DJs to put out mixes legally, basically. So I was putting out these workout mixes because I I love fitness and I was like, how can I not only do private events, but eventually I want to, I want to merge my love for fitness and working out. So I, I thought, okay, the good start is to put out these, these mixes. Well, I was hardly getting any views and listens. And when you try to promote something on Facebook or IG stories, you're going to get suppressed because they don't want you sending people to other websites. Yeah. I was getting, I was getting really frustrated. And one day I, I was working on my new mix. This was, I think, April, 2021. And I'm in my office. I've got my turntables pushed up against the wall. And I thought, maybe instead of promoting the mix, like go to this site and listen, I just show them one part of that mix. So I literally just grabbed my phone, propped it up against the wall on an iPhone box <laughs> with my speaker here. And I just said, uh, I looked at my camera and I said, Hey, check out this mix that I do. And I, and I put it out there on IG stories and I got way more engagement than I've ever, that I had ever gotten on, on a, on a story. I was like, Oh wow. I'm, I think I'm onto something. So I started making more of those and it was only a couple weeks before I put something out on on TikTok. And that's when I got, you know, a couple thousand views right away. I was like, okay, uh, this is fun. People like it. Let's go all in. But yeah, it wasn't a strategy at first. It was really just, how do I, how do I get this other strategy to work? And that was a byproduct of it. There's such a good lesson there. Uh, I, you know, I look at, you know, if we take this back to the financial advisor space, um, you know, YouTube's been around a long time and, I've coached so many advisors where they keep like delay, delay, delay until, oh, I just got to get this perfect. I've got to have the perfect studio. I've got to have, you know, I've got to have it thought through exactly what I want to say in my 10 minute video. And then they never do it because they're getting ready to get ready the whole time. And I love just the, like, get uncomfortable, you know, test it out while no one is watching because you had probably not a lot of followers at the time. And you're like, just build in public almost. And, and, happened similar with me on, on my podcast. It's just like, just do the interview and see what happens. And then once you put it out there, you see what hits, what resonates, the direction you want to go. And then you kind of iterate off of that one. Did, did you find that to be true on your side as well? hundred percent. Uh, and I did think about it when I put that phone up, I thought, Oh, I don't have a ring light. Mm. I don't have the audio source yet. And I really did. I did think, that, okay, maybe I shouldn't. And I'll go, no, I listen to people like, uh, say, Gary Vaynerchuk or, yeah. you know, just people who say, just, just put it out there. And so that popped in my head. Okay. I'm just going to put it out there. And that is just, 
the way to go and you just adjust from there. If you hesitate at all, you're not going to end up ever doing it. And what's the point? <laughs> like either yeah. you don't do it and you get nothing out of it or you try it and either get something or nothing, but at least you can have the opportunity to get something out of it. Um, so yeah, I, it did cross my mind, but I, I just, I knew better, talk myself out of it and just made the video. I love that. I'm a big fan of Gary Vee. Um, his strategy on document don't create, I love because he's like, if you're, if you're constantly thinking about how do I create content, you're creating content every day when you're DJing. So it's like, just document it and put it out, which I mean, just following your channel, I feel like, yeah, I, I've watched your more recent stuff. I haven't gone back and watched the early stuff. I'm assuming the early stuff is still out there. Do you have the the yes. early? Yeah. Cool. Everyone's I always love something from back 2021, but yeah. Nice. Well, I, I just love that because I mean, you even look at like Mr. Beast. I love that he's got his first videos out on YouTube because he's like this little nerdy kid just trying to figure out what he wants to be when he grows up. And yeah. uh, I love just watching the journey and back to Gary Vee, you're already doing the work. Now you're just documenting and putting it out and then iterating. And if you, if you have to do double work, which is I do my regular job. Now I have to go be a content creator. The beauty of today's world, like if, you're doing something that serves people in your day to day. You can literally just put it out there and, and see what hits and what doesn't and let that direct the path. So, okay, let's, let's go to, you start out on TikTok. It's April, 2021. When you say go viral, like, can you define what that means? Like what in the early days did going viral mean to you? Uh, so within a month I had a video get, I think 250,000 views on TikTok. And so for me, that was huge. And yeah. that felt like viral, but then, July uh, 5th or 4th, it doesn't matter, but early July, um, I had a video get a million views within a few days. And Lance Bass from InSync commented on it because it had an InSync song. Oh, okay. And uh, I was like, okay, that's viral. Uh, it got hit, you know, it got someone famous, it got their attention. Yeah. And that, yeah, that was my first viral video, which I feel like is a million, a million views. Okay. And so all of this is still on the TikTok platform at the time? Yep, all TikTok. I tried, okay. tried to cross, like I tried to post some of the videos on Instagram and it, they didn't perform well at that time. So I just, I was like, well, I'll just focus on TikTok and, and keep mm -hmm. it simple. So let's go, let's think, like start to get into the strategy part a little bit. So, so you start putting some, was this dropping a video every week? What was kind of your consistency at that point? Yeah. In the beginning it was, I was doing two to three videos a week and that was it. And then as I started to get some momentum, say, I don't know, probably fall, winter of 2021, I tried to do almost every day and just put one out as often wow. as I could, which was a lot. But yeah. uh, but I'd also, and then at that point, I also started to do TikTok lives. So I thought, okay, I want to engage my crowd. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's a good strategy for someone like me is to just be very likable just be myself, engage with them. So I would do TikTok lives and I have a microphone and I would I'd mix a track and talk to them. And sometimes I'd sing over the song and like, they just like, I did really well on my, on these lives. And uh, so that I combined that with trying to produce a new video every day or every other day. Um, it's hard to be hundred percent consistent, but yeah, that was kind of my strategy to um, just keep the momentum going. So did you see any, like, if I look at, at growing a platform and an audience, um, how much thought did you put into, here's my ideal watcher, viewer, listener, and this is kind of the demographic I want to go after, or is it just the internet and you're like, I'm playing, you know, pretty well-known songs. It's just going to figure itself out. And then did you see any difference when you were doing one or two a week when you went to daily? Did that really ramp up the numbers? Like, how did you see that all play out? You know, for me, what I did is in the beginning, I didn't really have a strategy, to be honest. I was just kind of winging it. And then mm -hmm. certain videos would take off. Like, for example, I mixed uh, In Sync with TLC. That was the viral video. And I thought, oh, early 2000s nostalgia. And people were like, oh, it takes me back to when I was a teenager. And so I started to pay attention to all these comments. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do some more of that. So, yeah. you know, I may not mix those all the time, but I thought, okay, this would be fun. Let's see what happens if I do like a Backstreet Boys and whatever. Uh, yeah. it, and that helped. That helped gain some momentum. So I, I almost see 
like if I do country hip hop and a video does well, I, I'm going to go in on that just a little bit more to kind of nurture the new set of eyes that are coming onto my page and to kind of feed them that. So I, but I weave in that. I mean, I'm, I'm a DJ, so I'm, I mix everything. So I, yeah. I'm all over the place, but I do try to have a little consistency here and there um, with certain styles. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and I see like when you do a country hip hop mashup, you're getting both of the genres audiences, right? Which is kind of cool. You're like, you're yeah. the hip hop people are like it and the country people like it. And um, so w- when you go back to where you started to see the numbers pop, let, let's go back. So you're 2021, you're primarily on TikTok. You ramped up the, the drops, right? And you did some lives. Um, if I'm like, if you're thinking through financial advisor lens, which I know you are not, but if you're like a financial advisor out there trying to start to grow an audience online, yeah. what are some of those strategies along the way that you think would cross over to finance? Is it the consistency and bumping that up? Is it seeing the content that hits and now going further down that path? But if you were going to coach a financial advisor, what sort of tips would you give them? Yeah, I I suppose, you know, you want to be as giving as possible with your crowd. So giving just real information that is going to help people and get them to want to like, Oh, I hadn't thought about that or whatever it is. And then when they go to your comment section, engage with them. Mm. And so that, that really was huge for me was engaging. I was always in the comment section, talking to people, answering DMS. Um, when I went live, I was recognizing people in those lives and my value was entertainment, right? So if it's your value is um, financial advising, what, information to the average does the average person not know and might appreciate give them that information very consistently whatever that means for you um and think of them think of your content think of the people that you're helping when you produce the content so uh just keep it simple like right like if if i'm new to learning how to invest don't give me the high level stuff like give me the very basic information and that's how you're going to reach the masses if you're trying to grow and then you can build on that um but it's really being consistent with what you're putting out there being yourself not a robot (laughs) Uh, i see a lot of djs try to copy what i do not that i was the first to do it but yeah when i watch i go oh there's a disconnect there like they're not being themselves and i can sense that so that's really a big key is people want the human element and the natural your natural personality to come out and they authenticity is uh, used a lot, but that's really true. Um, and then, yeah, if you can go live and talk to people, even if it's just 10 people, like start building that, that fan base that wants to come back every time you're on. The authenticity piece of that is so true. Um, and I find, you know, if you and I were having this conversation and we weren't being recorded, like we would just have a normal conversation, two dudes talking music, life, yeah. family, whatever. Right. But all of a sudden when that little record button clicks on, all of a sudden some people like freeze up or think they've got to be somebody else or they get self-conscious. Right. And myself included, I remember my early podcast, I was like, so worried about how I was going to show up or am I going to say something dumb? And the more reps I did, I just kind of settled in and got comfortable. Did you feel the same, like your progression, like if you watch the early ones where you kind of uptight, where you always just kind of natural and like, didn't, you were always yourself. Like if it's somebody that's just starting recording, what tips would you give them to like, here's how to just be comfortable in your own skin and be authentic. It's, it's a hard thing to master, <laughs> which sounds crazy because it's just being you, but mm-hmm. the key is, um, I, I don't know for me, I just, it just felt natural. I, I just what, what am I doing? Like if I'm mixing and no one's watching, how am I, what am I doing? And I was self-aware and I dance mm-hmm. around and I sing and I'm just into yeah. it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that and look in the camera when I do it. Um, and so that I, I, I'm talking to the one person on the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm being myself, but then I also, I do have to recognize that I am talking to somebody, but yeah. uh, not a group of people. I'm talking to you, not mm-hmm. 200 people. Cause that might be, you'll talk differently to 200. Yeah. You're really aware of that. So I think that's such a, a, a good hack. And that honestly, that's why I love podcasting because I am talking to one person, you know, or maybe sometimes I interview a couple people at a time, but like for right now, it's me and Eric having a fun conversation. I'm curious, I'm learning, 
I don't think about how many thousands of people are going to listen to this. If I did, I probably would start worrying about what I was saying, right? But if I'm just comfortable in it, so that that makes a lot of sense to me because you're like, I'm just DJing. And if somebody was across the DJ booth from me asking me what I'm mixing up, I'm just talking to them like one-on-one. Sounds like a very similar approach that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, some of my most viral videos, I'm just like, I'm setting up the video going, hey, check check this out. I just came up with this. Like, you won't even, you won't believe how these sound together, but just trust me. Like, I feel like I'm just talking to one of my boys, right? Yeah. And I go, all right, listen. And I do it. Um, you could do the same thing as a financial advisor. Be like, uh, man, I just discovered this new technique. Like, it's crazy. Like, here, let me show you. And it's just, mm. just talk to that, that like, uh, like a friend and, and yes. really try to embody that to a point where it, then it's not, you're not even thinking about, I don't even think about it anymore, but I had to in the beginning. Uh, yeah. Just to make sure I was connecting with people. So, such a simple concept, but, but I love that. That's like a hack right there. It's like, don't overthink it. You're just talking to a buddy. Yeah. Going back to serving your audience, I feel like one of the cool things about your content, because we're starting to get into like analyzing, you know, how you put it out. Sure. Like, it's almost like you're like, you are, you're like, you're like building or creating in public. And it's like, Hey, check this out guys. I think you'll like it. Um, but I feel like there's also a little bit where you're educating a little bit. Like, I don't know if it's all of your stuff or if I maybe saw a video or two where it's almost like, I think like DJing is really cool. There's, t- there's, there's a, a science and an art to it, right? Like syncing up the beats, but also it's an artistic approach. So there's no like right or wrong way to do it. Do you ever get it like when you were doing the lives, were you getting a bunch of questions like, hey, Eric, how do you do that? Like what, you know, like what's your technique? What's your strategy? Were you also educating people? Like here's actually how to DJ. Was that how you served your audience or or no? I didn't do a ton of it, to be honest. I did a little bit. People, if somebody asked me a question on a live, I'd be like, well, yeah, this, that, this orange button is this and I can mm-hmm. explain it to them. Um, gosh, now you got me thinking I should do, I should do more of that, but I do, I have done, I I have done hey, you'd have one, you'd have one viewer in Kansas if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, but I did, you know, I've done some videos where, um, you know, I'll go, Oh, did you, did you hear, did you know that this song is sampled by this song? And I'll go, here's the sample that Jack uh-huh. Harlow used in loving on me. And, and you hear the original like R and B singer. And then I go, okay, now here's his version. Now what they did is they sped it up, changed the key. And now here's how it sounds when you do that. Uh, and that, now it mimics the, you know, the sample or whatever. I won't get yeah. too deep, but yeah. It, yeah. So there is some education there. And I found that people love that because to me, it seems like obvious, but most people, it's not obvious because they're not in yeah. it. They're yeah. Um, so there's so. a little bit of like, it's almost like a little bit of music history you're working in a little bit. Some of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. But I do, I do like the idea of teaching, you know, what, what are these buddy, buttons doing and how to syncing up a song work and yeah. Well, well, be- Christy, who obviously you've interacted with on our experience team um, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm very excited for you to come out to the founders retreat, which is very kid friendly. So do business, do life. That means, you know, bring your crew and a lot of our members do. I believe we're going to do a DJ, how to DJ class with the kids. And I'm like, Christy, are you going to kick me out if the 43 year old dude comes, joins the kids class? (laughs) So we haven't figured that out yet, but I bet there'd be some adults that would find it very interesting as well. hundred percent. I get hit up all the time. Uh, I have a guy that just reached out. He's, I think he's into finance as well in California and he He's like, Google me. I'm not a creep. Like I'm a legit dude, but I just want to fly you out to teach me in an afternoon how to DJ so I can have um, fun at my, you know, at my house learning how to mix. I don't want to be a professional. I just want to do it for fun. So I have, I have people yep. hit me up all the time, gr- grown adults, professionals who want me to, to teach them how to do it. So That's I wouldn't cool. be surprised hey, if there's uh, some adults there. <laughs> you, you probably have a whole nother business model over on that side, assuming it fits the, Hey, would I actually have fun doing this? Right. Yeah, um, so, so let's go back to the, you start to blow up on TikTok. Um, I don't know if we, two paths I'll give you, you tell me which one makes the most sense. One is how did that impact the business? How did, how do you turn viewers or followers into actual revenue for your business? And then the other thing that's 
in my head is at what point did you start to expand and say, okay, TikTok's blowing up. Now I'm going to go to IG. Now I'm going to go to YouTube. Now I'm going to go to Facebook. Like whichever of those two makes sense to hit in order. Yeah. So the, let's see. The first one was how did it impact my business? Yeah. Um, I went from doing private events, making three to five grand per event. Um, then I was able to double, triple my rate and tr- travel the nation doing private events. So I hardly do anything in Boise now. So I'm making uh, double, triple my money plus more events, plus brand deals, plus TikTok and Instagram pay you a little bit. Um, I'm able to sell merchandise. Uh, what else? Um, I know I'm forgetting something, but yeah, I mean, there's just all these opportunities now. Collaborations with brands. Um, it's just dramatically changed my business a hundred percent. I'm selling all my DJ gear, like speakers and things like that. Like I don't have to have any of that stuff anymore. Um, I get to, to DJ as talent, you know, as a performer and not have to, to bring equipment with me. Um, little things like that. That's just, uh, things I dreamed about and set goals four years ago. Uh, those are all coming to fruition, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. (laughs) Awesome. And so how did, how did you let, let's just focus on TikTok. I, I, if you're okay, let's maybe go to IG because I feel like just looking at finance, I feel like most of financial advisors are on LinkedIn, Facebook slash IG, and then YouTube. Those are kind of what I'd say the more standard platforms that our industry's on. So I know you're doing, well, what'd you say? 850 K followers right now on IG, and that's more than doubled this year. So you'll be through a million, I'm guessing very soon. Um, was that just people DM you and you're booking things? Are you sending them to a website to like fill out like a, an intake form? What, what's, how are you booking going from there watching your videos to now they're booking you for events? Yeah. So a lot of it comes through, through my website. So, but through DMS as well, I've had some amazing opportunities come through. Um, there are hidden DMS, which is where I see a lot of, um, business come through. So, um, yeah, you click a tab that's like other or something like that. And then there's hidden DMS. People message me all the time saying, Hey, what are your rates? When we want to fly you out to this, you know, Florida for a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a retreat in July, like some company, maybe name triad. Gotcha. Yep. Triad, so, right. so you know, but yep. Yeah. So that, that happens. Um, but I also have, you know, I've been strategic about how people go to my storefront, which is my, my IG main page they're going to see that I make daily DJ reels and I have lots of followers and then click here and you can book me and find music. And so mm-hmm. the, one of the first tabs on my link tree is to go to my website and that takes them to a page where they can fill out a contact form. And then, you know, then it goes from there. So I get a lot of business that way. Um, yeah, but I blew up on TikTok, but I found that I wasn't getting a ton of business from TikTok. And so I thought, okay, IG I keep hearing is, is where it's at. Like that's where people like yourself, like a, a professional, they're mostly there. So yep. what I did, I think it was August or so 2022. So at that point I had like 1.1 million followers on TikTok and maybe 5,000 on Instagram. So I thought, okay, how am I going to grow this page? I just repurposed content. So I took my viral videos, started posting those. And it didn't take long before I did like my Warren G Morgan Wallen mashup and Warren G shares. That's a good it. one. That was a good one, by the way. That, that's one my big favorite. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he shared it and that turned into a conversation with him about trying to get Morgan Wallen on board to make it a, an official track. And so once I went to Instagram and started growing there, that's when high level people started contacting me and business really started to flourish from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt like it established me more. I, I don't know. There's just a stigma, I think, attached to TikTok where it's just kind of, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. But Instagram is very like, oh, you're legit if you have, if you're putting out content and you have a good followership. This is completely just me being a 43-year-old dude not knowing, but I would say if I was to put like blanket statements on platforms, TikTok would be like, I've got a 13, 14-year-old son now, like, that's where all his buddies are at is TikTok. So I feel like it's just a, like a younger generation for the most part where IG might be like, I feel like Facebook, 
you know, when I was in college, it was the thing. Now it's the old people platform. And now I feel like IG's just bolted onto it almost as a sister company. So I just feel like there's more of like our demographic on IG. We, have you found that to be true? I think that's fair. I, I do find that there are a lot of, a lot of adults on TikTok too, but it's just, okay. I don't know how to explain it. I think, <laughs> I don't know, but I think there definitely are more like less kids, more adults, more professionals, yeah. more serious people on Instagram than there are on TikTok. Are, are there any different content strategies for you when you look at TikTok versus IG or is it the exact same content strategy? I mean, TikTok for me is just putting out the videos, um, engaging in the comment section. And that's about it for me. Whereas Instagram is more multi-dimensional. I'm, I'm doing stories. I'm showing my family. I'm, um, you know, if it's a story, I might just be talking to the camera telling them what's going on. Uh, I, I'm not doing that on TikTok. So I feel like people really see the, the, the real me along with my DJ side on Instagram. And that's, that's where I feel like I'm showing everything and yeah. really building a culture. Uh, yeah. IG is where it's at for me is the cool. I'm building. There. So just because you brought it up and now I'm curious and there's gotta be some other fun stories. So you've officially had one of the backstreet boys engage with your stuff that was on TikTok, or was that in sync? In sync. Okay. Sorry. I, my boy band knowledge is, I know I was, I was more of like a, a limp biscuit guy at that era. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so, okay. So you had, um, you had them engage on TikTok. Then you went to IG, you dropped a Warren G Morgan Wallen track and Warren G like just DM'd you said, this is, this is good. He said, Hey, I want to get like, like, how did that come to be? Yeah. He, uh, shared it, followed me. He's kind of a chill dude. So he didn't really approach me. He just, he shared it twice. Cause I, I reposted it a couple of times. First time he just yeah. shared it, reposted it again later in the year. But then he shared it and tagged, uh, I think his manager or somebody and was like, Hey, mm-hmm. let's make this a thing. Like, let's make this a track. And then I DM'd him and I said, Warren, you want to make this a track? Like, like, can we talk or whatever? And that started the conversation. So I had to be proactive with that, but yeah, yeah. Um, and that turned into some conversations with him and, and trying to make it happen. And afford, unfortunately it didn't happen. Um, yeah. but, uh, any but yeah, other, cool any other fun stories like that where, you know, mashups you've put out where it's like, wow, it's like the people that the artists are like, wow, this is really good. Like, thanks. Yeah. For one of my favorite is, uh, Chris Stapleton. Now we haven't talked or anything, but I did a Dr. Dre Snoop Dogg, nothing but a G thing with one of his songs. And this was just a couple months ago. And he, you know, put it on his IG stories. And I was the, I was the only person on his IG stories for 24 hours. So something like that, I was like, that's pretty yeah. bad. It's Cause I'm a huge fan of his music. Yeah. Uh, but I have, I have, I don't know. I don't know. I hate to name drop, but like, I don't know, like Brett Favre is a big fan of mine. And so he's, he's always liking my stuff and mm-hmm. engaging. And, you know, some people that I looked up to as a kid, Ken Griffey yeah. Jr., like there's some big athletes that are um, big fans and followers of mine. So that's always really cool. Um, yeah. Not a ton of conversations or, you know, collabs in that way from big names, but it's probably only a matter of time. Um, yeah. Of time. Well, I it's just, it's fine. One of the things I've found, and, and this is a content creation strategy. Um, if you look at the content you're creating, I look at the, the same thing on the podcast. Like, here's what's cool. Like, I've got my audience. You've got your audience. We're basically doing a collab right now, right? Our, this podcast is a collab. And you're doing the same thing with music. But what's cool and the lesson that I think advisors out there, you know, I've, I actually just did a coaching call this morning on a couple fun brothers, Dana and Tyler out of San Antonio. They're like, Hey, they're trying to figure out their podcast, their YouTube channel, what they want to do. And I'm like, guys, the benefit of a, a guest sort of format is if you put out great content and you bring people on that also have audiences and followings, like some of their people are going to watch your stuff. And now you're like organically growing. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Like artists you're mashing up are liking your stuff. And now you're getting put in front of their audience, which is bringing more people yeah. over to, to your channel. So um, 
do you totally. use any of that in your strategy where you're like, hey, like here's an up and comer, like this song's really hot right now. Let's let's mash that in to to grow the audience. I know you had one other strategy we want to get into here in a second, but do you think through that just when you're picking which tracks to mix up? Um, that's something that that's starting to be on my radar. Like I've had mm -hmm. a, a just this morning actually, like an hour ago, I had a a, a kid who was on American Idol and did really well and he i'm sure he hit up a lot of djs but he hit me up and was like hey i got this track i want to i want to promote it i think you know i think what you do is cool and it just got me thinking I'm like okay maybe maybe i do mash up some up-and-coming person yeah. and you know because he's got a million plus followers and so like yeah if I resonate, you know, I got to like the music. I don't want right. to you know, sell out or anything, but if it's like, Oh, that's a good fit. Let's do it. Let's help each other grow. Um, I think that just makes sense. And I don't even think about the money necessarily. It's just really like, that'll all come. What's going to be fun and what's going to help us grow and create cool new opportunities. And yeah, I, well, you did one other strategy. I saw this has been a, a few months. Um, you did, all, you kind of went through the nineties era and you did like the top 10 songs from each year or something. I don't know exactly, but you went through each year and I'm like, well, shoot, that was my freshman year of high school. Then my sophomore year. And of course, back to nostalgia, I'm like, I'm watching every single one. I'm like, oh dang, I forgot about that one, you know? And so yeah. as far as different strategies, I feel like you do a good job of like experimenting and you're like, oh, that's kind of taken off. Okay. We're going to go further down that rabbit hole do you find you're constantly kind of experimenting with different formats that way? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it does a couple things. It, one, it keeps the, the audience interested. Um, I feel like it's only a matter of time before doing the same old thing. People are just going to get bored with it and go, Oh yeah, we've seen that a million times. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, keeping it fresh and interesting, I think is important for your audience, but it's also like when I was on that kick of doing those, you know, top, 12 songs from 1997 that was fun for me like i'm getting nostalgic going, oh yeah I forgot, I forgot about that song and so yeah. i'm excited to put it out and so when i put it out like my enthusiasm shows and I'm, that was fun to make you know mm -hmm. um and that i think just resonates with the audience so it's um keeping it fresh but also keeping for them but also keeping it fresh for me too to, to keep my excitement and creativity going yeah okay so you shared something before we hit record and you said i think it was towards the end of last year, if I'm getting the dates wrong, just tell me, but you said, Hey, I, my, my growth on my channels had kind of like stalled for a little bit. Yeah. And what you did, which I, I think this was a Gary Vaynerchuk strategy. I heard from one of his videos. So I don't know if you got it there, if you just came up with it on your own, you went back to your most viral uh, videos and you yeah. started repurposing them, almost like redropping them as, you know, a, a new release. And that like bumped you up again, where you started to like, amplify growth again so how like if you're dissecting your strategy how did you go about that yeah so it was late november 2023 i, I my page just it literally just stalled i could not grow my page for a couple of weeks and i've it was i was thinking i was at like a 416,000 followers actually this was the number and this uh, was ig i'm guessing IG, yeah instagram okay. yep and so i just uh I was like, all right, I'm going to post my most viral video, which is Morgan Wallen, Warren G. And let's just see what happens. And so I posted that and it started to gain momentum again. I'm like, hmm. And I didn't really hear this from anybody, but I just kept thinking like, wow, I have all these. Like when I posted that, I had maybe 50,000 followers the first time. Now I have 416,000 followers. That's a lot of people that have not seen this video yet. Yeah. Then I thought, well, how many people are actually on Instagram? I don't know, a billion, who knows, like a ton. And I only have 400,000 followers. So that is even a whole nother pool of people that haven't seen this video yet. And it's not like, it's sort of evergreen. All of my content is. Yeah. So I thought I'm just going to start posting all of my old stuff. I don't have to try to be creative. I have this backlog catalog and I started doing that and um, I gained so much momentum that way. Uh, even my top 10 songs that we just talked about, I reposted those too. And some of them went really viral and it, I, I still use that strategy now to this day. Like I'm, I'm getting ready for CMA fest in Nashville where I'm DJing for Chevy. And now I'm repurposing a lot of my country hip hop stuff to kind of yeah. create excitement for this week of country music. Um, 
nobody cares. Fans are going to love it because they're fans. New people will have, may not have ever heard it. That They might become new followers. Uh, there's just nothing but benefit to repurposing that old content. So I think it's a, an unused or at least not unused, but very minimally used uh, strategy by people. And if you yeah, have, you're just keep doing it. You're just DJing your your own your greatest hits, man. It, it only makes sense. You're a DJ. You're just going back to your best stuff and. Well, think about game. think about Vanilla Ice, for example. That dude is still milking Ice Ice Baby. Yeah. He's still going to shows, performing that same song. I'm not, you know, it was his big hit. Like he, you, that's part of who you are. I think part of who I am is Warren G. Regulate more. I may get a little sick of it, not yet, but. It's like, why not keep posting it? I'm going to keep promoting it. Like, it's a big thing. Like, why not make that part of my strategy to put that out there uh, every once in a while? Vanilla Ice and (laughs) Sir Mix-a-Lot. You play their two one-hit wonders, and you watch our era just light up and end up on the dance floor every time. They go crazy. (laughs) Some of those songs I know, for me, I'm like, I know this is going to be a big, whatever I mash up with this, our age group's going to love it. It's yeah. it's I have some go tos in that regard. Have, have you done a baby got back mashup yet? You know I haven't. Just saying, I, I, man. Just all right. saying. I'm gonna tag you. Come away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, funny. I have not done baby got back. That's a that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think I think I was in sixth grade and I should not have probably been listening to that song in sixth grade, but I was. So but, yeah. 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 Um, well, cool. Okay. So let's, um, so going back just to, to like hit that last strategy home now, like if we said, and I don't know how dialed in you make this Eric where you're like, Hey, no, like here is my posting strategy, like three new ones, one greatest hit that I work in. Like what's your post? Like, let's just focus on IG. Cause it sounds like that's kind of where you're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. How, how frequently are you dropping new content on Instagram? So for me, daily, no new content. So reg- regular content, I put in my in my bio daily DJ mixes for people or daily mixes for people who love music, something like that. Mm-hmm. That's to hold myself accountable to either repost or post something new every single day. So yeah, I, re- I still repost all the time, um, but new stuff I try to do two to four new videos a week. Um, sometimes I might just post a picture telling a little story about you know where I came from or things like that. Mm-hmm. So that might be a post that I make because um, I still do static posts too. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I try to do something fresh two to four times a week and then repost old content at, um, so that I have something every single day. And when you're creating new content, do you find you batch it where like, hey, Friday's my cut new videos and then obviously you're going to drip those out, you know, over the next week or two um or or are you just like i randomly am producing content all throughout the week like what what's your like back to if i was a financial advisor and i'm trying to develop a strategy to build a following on a platform what have you found to hold you accountable keep you consistent with dropping content is like a week in the life of eric dj eric Rhodes. like how would you like lay that out I think the smart thing to do is to batch your content, maybe spend Monday uh, coming up with your ideas, building all of that out. And then Tuesday, you spend your you know morning, afternoon, whatever it is, carve that time out, record it, and then have it ready to, to post whenever you decide to post it. Mm-hmm. What I typically do, though, is not that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the truth. But I do sometimes. I do sometimes, and I'm like, man, I should do this more often. <laughs> but I don't. Uh, and I need I need to get back into it. So I'll tell you, that's the smart thing to do. Um, but for me, it's, you know, if I'm working on a set for a DJ mix for Mixcloud or for Nashville, I'm coming up with new ideas. And usually what happens to me, you know, because I'm in this creative space. So I, I may go work on this mix, but then I go, I'm always thinking of mashups and content and I may go down this rabbit hole of like one song. What can I mix with this? Oh my gosh, this would be amazing. I, I forgot about some mix a lot. And I, now I'll spend an hour trying to figure out what I could do. And then I'll post <laughs> because my, like I act upon my impulse of creativity. Got it. 
Yeah, you're like uh, you're in the flow state. So you're like, boom, just I came up with this. It sounds kind of good. Record it right now in the moment. Yeah, I do a lot of that. Or I'll or I'll have an idea and I'll just sit on it. But it's not quite right, and I'll you know I'll just pocket that and then show my wife later and be like, hey, what do you think of this? You know, I'll do I'll do that a lot. Get her feedback, and then I'll mm-hmm. think, okay, I'll work on it a little bit longer, and then when it's ready, I post. Um, mm-hmm. So it's very very random. <laughs> I wish, but I I know that's not the like the best strategy, but it's, it's worked for me, but I think, yeah, I think when I have batched and t- spent time, like really coming up with these things, uh, it tends to, they tend to do really well. Um, uh, and yeah, I would say one thing with that though, is like post consistently, like for me, I love posting at like seven, eight, nine in the morning, well, depending on what time zone I'm in, but, mm-hmm. uh, that tends to people love to start their day with this like fresh content. Um, that I found in the evening when people are winding down after dinner, uh, they're, they typically are on their phones. So I, I, I post sometimes in the evening, uh, but being consistent. So people expect know when to expect it, even if they're not conscious of it is really helpful. Um, yeah. So that's a little side. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I think consistency is so key to me. Consistency does one other thing it psychologically builds trust it's like this dude's dependable like he's constantly it says on his thing daily and he's dropping daily and that was like my early days of podcasting it was kind of an experiment early on and i was doing one episode a month and then as i started to geek out a little bit i'm like wait every legit podcaster is putting out at least an episode a week and you know it wasn't my it was kind of like you it was not my full-time gig it still isn't my full-time gig But, um, what I realized is if you can at least get to weekly, you can become part of a human's routine. And so now I've got advisor, like every Friday, I drop every Wednesday at like 4am back to the, you know, people start their mornings a certain way. But then I, like one of our, our uh, members out in Denver, David, you'll meet him. Uh, he's like every Friday morning, that's my DBDL podcast. Like I listen to the new episode every Friday on the drive to work. And I'm so you can start to get in people's weekly routines, um, which is probably exactly what you're doing. People are probably waking up, getting ready for work. What's the latest mix that dropped this morning? You know? Yeah. hundred percent. It's yeah. I honestly hadn't really thought about it that way, but definitely it is. It's, it's the routine. Um, I think I listen to a lot of uh, Andy Frisella. I like his podcast. Yeah. yeah. And he's ridiculously consistent and he's a, he's the 75 hard guy, right? The guy that yeah. came up with that workout. Yeah. 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 So I know like Mondays, I'm getting this podcast, Tuesdays, I'm getting this one, Wednesday's off, Thursday's this. It's like, yeah, it's become part of my routine. Um, and so, yeah, doing that for other people, it's a great way to build your, your trust. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go to, you've mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk, you've Andy Frisella. Are there content creators or just those that have influenced your approach to putting out content? And maybe it's not just content, maybe it's life in general. Um, but, but who, who has influenced you and, and how, as you built your business, there are a couple creators that I follow and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on their names right now, but, uh, we could put them in the show notes, but they just give you tidbits every day about what's, what Instagram is doing with their algorithm, what Instagram's, you know, ways to mm. produce your reels. Um, and I think, you know, they, they also focus on, um, people who are trying to sell things. Like, I don't feel like I'm trying to sell a lot, Mm -hmm. but I do pay attention to what they say. And, um, it might be good for your audience is they, they teach you how to like sell without selling. If that makes sense, it's it's like soft, but in a good way. And you can build a community, but also build an email list and like all these things. And so I love following these guys because, um, I think that's just that kind of information is very beneficial and they just give it out pretty freely. And, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to remember, I'll remember and get that to you so you can, you can put it in. Yes. Selfishly, I would love it for triad. Kelly runs our social account. She's awesome. And she's, she's probably 24, 25. So she's grown up this, uh, this like IG is like the back of her hand and I'm just the old guy that's trying to figure it out. And, but what I love about IG is like, especially stories you can put. So like you can link, you can overlay music. There's just so many creative things you can do to make it easy. Like, Hey, like this, click here if you want to learn more. And it's like super, super seamless, like no friction in the sales process or where you're trying to send them. 
Um, right. Are there other just like thought leaders or like, hey, this book hit me and really influenced like how I live my life or how I run my business? Any Anything else that's really had a big influence on you? You know, it's not a content creation thing, but, you know, since we're talking finance, well, years ago, I read uh, Dave Ramsey. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, what is it called? No, I forget. But his baby well, steps. He's, he's written a lot of them, so... Yeah, so he was basically like getting out of debt. Like, obviously, that's what he's known for. But money makeover. Yeah. So oh, yeah, yeah. that that was one thing that you know, my wife and I came out of college and and a little bit out of, you know, right before we had kids, we had ninety thousand dollars in debt, mm-hmm. and paying all of that off over a matter of three years was game changer for us. Like we we made we we were able to take risks. I was able to take risks in my business. Um, I was able to get through COVID pretty easily compared to a lot of people I know in my industry um, because they were just buried in debt with equipment and all these things. And I just live like very much like a cash life. And um, now I'm starting to leverage debt a little bit, but um, I'm, I'm established now. I don't feel like it's, I'm not going to get yeah. taken. So um, he's somebody that really helped me on my journey just in learning how to do that um lewis howes was a big um i listened to his podcast in the early days a lot of stuff that he taught and um talked about was really big for me yeah no i love it uh your your story on ramsey well like to start triad i I walked away from an incredible i mean i'd I'd worked in in the industry for someone else at a different company and you know i was a small town farm kid I, i didn't come from much and i was making more money annually than I ever thought I would make in a lifetime. And that's really scary to, to leave that behind, to go venture into the unknown, which you've done a couple of times and, you know, start your own thing up. And I remember, so one of my favorite books is the daily stoic uh, by Ryan holiday. And it's just kind of stoic thinking. It's just a short passage each day, but one of the ones that always hit home with me, I forget the guy's name, but he was a famous um, photographer, I believe. So he'd do these these uh, photo shoots for these magazines. And of course he's, he's an artist. So he's like, I'm putting out the stuff I want to put out. And of course the magazine's like, here's what we need. And sometimes they didn't always agree. And he goes, he was giving advice to another photographer in this story. And he's like, you know what, kid, if you don't take their money, they can't control you. <laughs> and you know what I love is Cause sometimes he would just do the work and not bill them. And he's like, they can't tell me what to do. I'm not asking to get paid. And so <laughs> So I, th- I look at that, like in your story, getting out of debt, if you have debt, it controls you. If mm. you get out of debt, you have freedom. If you're controlled by a biweekly paycheck and you can't live without it, now you're controlled. If you can live without it, now you have freedom to do what you want. And so I just think it's a really good lesson in life, uh, to live by. And, um, it's not as scary if, if you're not venturing into the unknown with like no money, you know, if you're, if you're prepared. So I love that. That, that, that hits home with me, man. Yeah. I love that. And that's, you know, it's part of my strategy now is like, okay, it, I'm de- my income for the most part is dependent on me performing. And so my next level is like, okay, how do I, how do I earn income without having to be there? And so yeah. that's, I've always known that, but I think I've hit a spot where now I can figure that out. So if something happens to me, my, my family's still good. Yeah. I'm still good. And, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not dependent on me now, but yeah. what I've built and invested yeah, that, in. Well, it's, it's funny. We literally, that's one of the reasons financial advisors come to try it, Eric, is it's like, they want to build a business that's bigger than them because most financial advisors, it's exactly like being a DJ. They have to show up, do the appointment to drive revenue. And as you start to build a business, you know, with multiple team members, uh, for them, that's oftentimes cloning themselves, so they're not the only selling advisor driving revenue. Um, but I think that's a really important thing in life. We call it the hit by a bus test. Like, it's not a business if you get hit by a bus, one person gets hit by a bus, and the business is done. You know, and so I think anything yeah. you're building, you want you want that that freedom to where it, it outlives you. You know, all the all the businesses that that we admire, you know, whether it's Apple or Steve Jobs is no longer around, but guess what? They're still selling a lot of iPhones. So he built a pretty cool business. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Love well, it. hey, I know we're getting at the end, man. It flew. I knew it would. Yeah. We're gonna have to um so we're gonna have to throw the Warren G. Morgan Wallen 
uh, mashup. We're gonna have to throw that in the show notes. So if there's any others that are some of your favorites, maybe like your top five favorites or whatever, like when when you get the other the couple other influencers, just drop that to me in an email or text, and we'll we'll throw that in the show notes so everybody that hasn't seen your stuff can can check it out. For um, sure. I've got just one final question on my side. So at Try It, I'm excited. Number one, you're going to get experience this, and hopefully it works for the family too. We'd love to have them out. And um, so we've we've got uh, the Do Business, Do Life Founders Retreat, which fortunate enough that you're going to be joining us uh, this summer. And this is the Do Business, Do Life podcast. So for us, our mission at Triad is to to help our members level up in business and in life. And for us, that's that's the infinite game. You never your business is never going too good. Life is never go, going too good to call it quits. So um, I'm just curious, what is Eric Rhodes' definition of doing business, doing life? What's that mean to you? I think it, you, how you live your personal life and how you live your life in general is all tied to your business. Um, if I'm full of anxiety or have a rough, you know, patch with my wife, I think that affects my business. If affects how I show up. So, um, I used to think of them as separate life and business, mm. but it's all intertwined and in, in one. And so doing business and doing life is just, um, it's the one and the same. And I always try to do my best all the time and always work on getting better and improving um, who I am and how I work and how I treat people. And um, all of that just elevates everything. It elevates your relationships. It elevates your income. It elevates all of it. And so um, just, just living that way is uh, doing business and doing life. I love it, man. And, and what's cool in this story and what you've shared with us today, like you've modeled that you haven't just talked about it. Like you've made the decisions in life you're like, Hey, I don't really like this job. I'm going to change so I can live life on my terms. And guess what? Your business blew up right along with it. So it's awesome to see how that's played out for you, man. Well, Thanks. thank you so much, Eric. Uh, love the conversation. Can't wait to get this one out to the world and excited to hang in person here in a few months. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome, Brad, man. Thank you for having me. All right, man. Till we see each other in person. Take care.